watches. We thank you so much for coming to our third uh, Sunday of Advent. And we are glad that you're here with us at the Rush Hill Church. We are going to um, turn into our uh, Bibles or on the screen, Luke 2, 8 through 14. It's a scripture you'll know. As we talk about joy, this is our third Sunday. Have hope, peace, and joy. Luke 2, 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a babe be wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men from whom his favor rests. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. In 1995, a lady by the name of Jeannie Colment, who lived in Paris, not Paris, Missouri, but Paris, France, was inducted into the Guinness World Book of World Records. She was the oldest human on record, 120 years old. She was born in 1875 one year before the telephone was invented. She was working nearby when the construction of the Eiffel Tower was being constructed and she watched it go up. She sold colored pencils to Vincent Van Gogh. She survived 27 French presidents. And when they asked her, what is your secret? So such a long life. She says it's joy and laughter. The Bible says that a cheerful heart is good medicine in Proverbs 17.22. And it surely, surely is. Our scripture today is, like I said, a very, very popular scripture at Christmas time. And I just love to kind of think a little differently than a lot of people do, but I put myself out there with those shepherds. Can't you just see those shepherds out there and all of those sheep that sheep that night, sheeps, the sheep out there that night, all the stars, beautiful stars, quiet, and all the shepherds laying back probably from eating a, a good supper of whatever, and they were watching their sheep. Farthest from their mind would be angels or the answer to a prophecy that they probably had forgotten about, at least for the time being. Peaceful night. And then this happens, and I love when we say this, but God. <laughs> but God, in his perfect timing, in his perfect place, in a perfect people, the Messiah was announced and born. God continued to reveal the news about his son. Now, I know there was a lot said about the shepherds. Why would the shepherds be picked? And we know that there's a lot of reasons that the shepherds would be the ones picked to see this newborn king. And if we study and think about it, we'll see that there was a, a very, very likely reason why it was them. Because they were watching over sheep that would be used eventually for sacrificing for the forgiveness of sin. Hmm. And now they're being told about the one sacrifice 
that would only be needed one time. Jesus Christ. A perfect lamb. No longer need to be afraid. Good news. Great joy to all people. The Messiah, the long-awaited one, is here. So far in our Advent season, we have talked about our waiting and their waiting. Hope, peace, and now joy. All of these are a lot alike, but yet they're a little bit different. Same for them as same for us. First is hope. We have great hope. They had great hope. They had been promised a king would come. And he came. But they had great hope. You and I understand there's a great hope too. Jesus Christ is coming back and we have great hope. And because of that we have peace. No matter what all the things going on, and we'll talk much more about that in a second, but all the things that's going on in our life, and the same way with them. No matter who was in charge or in the rule or the things that they didn't want to go through, they had great hope. And they had peace because of that hope, which now got, turns to joy. Because the Savior had been born. Great hope, peace, and joy. So, what exactly is joy? The kids and I talked about joy. And we're going to talk a lot more about it. Charlie Brown said it on his Christmas program. Charlie Brown says, I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. I want Christmas to make me joyful, but I just don't know how. There's millions of people the very same way as Charlie Brown. Of course, at the end of the program, they, Linus showed him what the true joy of Christmas was. But how can I be joyful? How can, this is your first one up there. How can joy become a characteristic in my life? How can joy become characteristic in our life? Number one, joy grows out of real worship. A. Worship involves both celebration and confession. When we think of worship, we just think about sitting in a church sometimes with our hands holding and, and, and singing all the songs and praising worship and all that's good stuff. At home, talking and praying and asking God to forgive us. Those are all important things. But also there's joyful, there's celebrations. God wants us to celebrate. He did with his Old Testament people. He says, have festivals, have feasts, eat and joy, and remember what I have done for you. And that's what he's doing with us. At Christmas time, we are to remember all the things that he did for us. And at Christmas time, uh, celebrate and, and to have a wonderful time eating and enjoying our fellowship with our our friends and our family and our loved ones, he wants us to celebrate along with our meditation. Worship is involved with both celebration and confession. Number two, joy comes from being in God's presence. Being in God's presence. Let's look at Psalms 16, 8 through 9. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, and my body also will rest secure. Hmm. Happiness. Joy. True joy is far deeper, as the kids and I talked about, than happiness. Happiness happens all the time. We have good things and bad things. Every single day, think about that. We have happy things. We have things that's not so happy every single day. But every single day of our life that we're in Christ, we have joy every day, no matter what goes on. Happiness is temporary because it's based on external, external circumstances. External, 
You know, Phil wasn't real happy about his truck. But we still have joy in the things of God in our lives. External circumstances. Joy is lasting because it is based on God's presence within us. No one was hurt. Can't we always take a, a, a step back and say, well, it could have been worse. Can't we always do that? And think about how God has is always with us. As we think about God daily and his daily presence, we will find contentment as we understand the future he has for us. We will then experience joy. Just thinking of what God's going to have for all of us now and forever. The secret is this. One of your questions don't base your life on circumstances, but base it on God. Base it on God. Number three, joy comes from having the Holy Spirit. Joy comes from having the Holy Spirit. Look at A. True Spirit, uh, the Spirit produces traits that are in Christ. The Holy Spirit that lives in us. We know when we accept Christ our Lord and Savior, that our Holy Spirit lives in us, and He is guiding and directing us all the time. Look at Galatians, uh, Galatians 6, 22 through 23. 5, I mean. 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. There it is. Peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such a thing there is no law. You know, these are the gifts that we have from or the traits, if you will, that we receive of Jesus Christ when we accept him into our hearts. When we let him live in us, these things are going to happen. But they're not all that natural in our world today, are they? Peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness. We have to have that from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can't just buy them. We can't purchase them. We can't earn them. We get them when we accept him as our Savior. We must join our lives in his. Look at John 15, 4 through 5. 14, 4 through 5. Remain in me as I have also remained in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, Jesus said. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I'm in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Boy, that says it pretty soundly, doesn't it? You accept him. Let him live inside of our lives. And his lifestyles, his obedience, his priorities, will come out in the lives that we live. When we do that, Jesus will shone through, through our lives. Number four. Well, wait, wait I'm, 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 I've missed one here. John 14, 4 through 5, I just read that. We must know him. We must love him. We must remember him, and we must learn to imitate him. And when we do that, Jesus will show through in our lives. Okay, number four. We can be joyful in spite of our circumstances. Let's look at Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say rejoice. I say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice doesn't seem like a real odd scripture until you realize that the man that wrote it was in prison. He was in prison. Isn't it odd that Paul would have such an attitude? Rejoice in the Lord as he wrote to those people while he's sitting there in the prison. His attitude teaches us an important lesson. Our inner attitudes do not have to reflect 
our outward circumstances. We don't have to go around with a big lip all the time. Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. We don't have to go through that all the time. We don't have to let the outward circumstances reflect what's going on in our lives. Paul was full of joy because he knew that no matter what happened to him, Jesus Christ was with him. So he could have joy. It's pretty easy to get discouraged about all the unpleasant circumstances around us today. Or take unimportant events so seriously. We do that all the time. Sometimes they are serious. But ultimate joy comes from Christ dwelling in us. Christ is near. And at his second coming, we will fully realize the ultimate joy. We can feel joy now. We don't have to wait for Christ to come. But when he does come, it'll be a joy that we've never even dreamed of. And we can understand it. Here's your last question. Christ, who lives within us, will, full, will fulfill his final purpose for us. And we will have complete joy. I want to share a story as we close with you. A very cute story. It starts out with a man who cleans his kitchen really clean and it's sparkling clean and he goes off probably to work for a few hours and he comes back and he opens the door and he is gape and a gall. <laughs> the kitchen's a mess. Utensils everywhere, flour everywhere, Ingredients everywhere on the floor and everything. Obviously, his little daughter was cooking. And he was just building and building. You know how that is? You get madder and madder and madder. But amongst all of that clutter and nastiness and mess, he sees a little note, clumsily written. And it says... I'm making, M-A-K-I-N, something for, number four, you, Daddy. Signed, your angel. At that point, something happened. In the midst of that discouragement and disarray, despite his irritation, something was changing. Joy was overcoming the anger. It was springing up in his heart. Sweet and pure. His attention now was being redirected from the problem to the little girl who loved him so much with such a pure little heart. He delighted in her. And with her simple goodness and focus, he he took pleasure in seeing her hand at work in a situation that seemed at that one time disastrous. The same way is true for our joy in the Lord. Life often looks rather messy. Sometimes it even looks disastrous. Not much to be happy about sometimes, we think, in the circumstances around us. However, we can look very hard, and we can see the Lord behind it all, or at least working through it all. He's making something for us. Our attention can then be redirected from our problems to the Lord that loved us so much that he gave his only son. We can take all the pleasure in seeing what God's hand is in our life. Pure in love. And we can see through past the problems. Peace, joy, 
and the presence of Jesus Christ. I bring you good news of great joy. And his name is Christ the Lord. Let's look at our last scripture. James 1, 2 through 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, come to you today on this Christmas season, we know that all things are not just perfect. In fact, there's all kinds of bad things going on in our lives, but yet the good things are deep-seated in our life and in our hearts. Jesus Christ is there. We may not always understand what's going on, but we know that you have the very best for us. In our, uh, for us. We may not always understand it, but we can have faith in it. And we know, Lord, that's how we have pure joy, even in a world that seems to be crumbling around about us. We thank you, Lord. Guide and direct us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.